Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing with Fishes pod- podcast. Oh, there we go. Now it's working. Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast, episode 199. Uh, we were Woo! almost 200. Uh, this week we have uh, Bob Hemphill, is a world-renowned breeder, a longtime uh, supporter of the cannabis industry. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. We also have Glad Marty. To have you. We also have Marty from AP Meds. Hey, how's everyone doing? And we have Roger. Hey, from, and we have Roger from ILGM. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> and um, and I'm Steve from Potent Ponics. And uh, if you like uh, aquaponic can- uh, cannabis growing in particular, be sure to check out the Future Cannabis Project on uh, June first. At 7 p.m. Pacific, uh, Marty, myself, uh, Bain Howard of Vertica, uh, Ian from, um, um, uh, Ch- or uh, AKA Chief Cultivator from uh, uh, Habitat Life, as well as uh, Tanner Stewart from Stewart Farms, will all be on the, uh, as a panel talking about commercial aquaponic cannabis. It'll be really awesome. Uh, so be sure to check that out. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Bob, for joining us. Uh, what's up? I don't think I've ever seen that. I was just going to say, I don't think I've ever seen a place where so many aquaponic cannabis growers will, will be on the same panel other than, other than here. I think that's probably the only, the only place. Oh, yeah. No, it, it'll definitely be the, the largest uh, commercial aquaponics cannibal, cannabis panel that's actually been, been hosted to date on, on anyone's channel, better yet, uh, better yet ours. Um, we haven't even had that many commercial yeah. producers on simultaneously. So uh, uh, no, they talk. Independent together yeah, yeah the, they reached out to me after the breeder steve's episode and they're talking about aquaponics and uh and we put together a pretty cool panel of people so it'll be a lot of fun uh so uh bob why don't you tell us a little bit about your history and uh, and uh, your background in, in the industry um just really i've been growing cannabis most of my adult life it started when i was in high school and um Really, just uh, been committed to preservating, uh, preservation, keeping clones alive, and open pollinations with land race genetics. So, what are some of the different land race genetics um, that you've had the pleasure of uh, pleasure of working with? <clears throat> My favorites are the Afghani and Paki lines, um, like. M10, um, also known as Afghani number one. Um, that's one of my favorite ones. It was sent from uh, Kabul in 1979 to California and uh, preserved and was sold through a Super Sativa Seed Club in the um, 80s and early 90s. They w- went out with Operation Green Merchant. Um, that was the big gray that targeted all the cannabis growers and um, seed makers at the time in 89. Um, I'm luckily uh, preserving that genetic um, and quite a few other land race Afghani lines and several Pakis and Panama Red line I've been working with uh, trying to isolate the CBD side. Just all kinds of cool stuff. Very interesting. And what are, some, what, are, what are some of the different unique traits that you noticed or maybe a little bit stronger in the land race that you, you don't see uh, very often in more of the commercial, uh, commercially produced varietals? Well, in California, when you're talking commercially uh, produced varieties, uh, everything goes back to cookies. You know, it's Sunset Sherbet or Gelato or do dough or London Pound Cake, Cereal Milk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, that genetic is very bottlenecked. And, you know, it's been bottlenecked to have amazing qualities, you know. Um, but there's a lot more to cannabis. Like when I first started growing and uh, smoking in the early nineties, there was so many types of cannabis, not just, you know, cookies. 
And um, a lot of that started disappearing. And, you know, right around 2000, I really specialized in saving all the old clones that I could find anything that was old. Um, could get my hands on basically and still to that day on on that same mentality i've got some very old clones and you know some of them i kept 20 years myself so what, what's your oldest guy you know when it goes past my date it's all hearsay and um you know what's passed down through you know cannabis legend and lore and um you know, we're a bunch of stoners, but you know, I got a Romulan cut that said to go back to 1979. I got the um, train wreck cut. Um, people call it the Arcata cut that don't live in Humboldt, but uh, people in Humboldt just call it train wreck. Um, that one is said to be from 81. Um, Got Airborne's G13, which was NL2 G13 cross from about the same time. Uh, just a whole bunch of them. A lot of them from the 90s. But uh, say it's hard to think of them all. We say that age you're talking about, like Marty brought up and you just answered that, something you know that somebody you knew that was growing that back in there and not an old strain that, say, train wreck that you can get seeds of now, but you're talking about taking cuts from a ongoing growth since the eighties or nineties. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I'm talking about the same clone and, um, yeah, I provenance is very, very important to me. I don't just pick these things up at, you know, cannabis clubs and stuff. I get them from the right circles of people. Um, I used to travel around on dead tour and, Met a bunch of people doing that, and like I said, I've been growing since the early 90s, moved to Humboldt County in 97. So, uh, I just always pretty much uh, dedicated most of my adult life to it. That's awesome. I always find it interesting how much of their 90s cuts are still around. I know we're growing Chem, Chem Dog 91. You were just talking about an 80s cut, and uh, a lot of people kind of associate some of the best stuff with, and the strongest stuff with being some of the newer stuff. But, you know, it's kind of funny that it often harkens back to some of the oldest genetics that are still around uh, and not always some of the newer stuff. Without a doubt, everything that's good, uh, including cookies, goes back to OG Kush or chem dog um and you know uh chem dog especially and og kush are two of my favorite varieties but um once those guys in san francisco got a hold of that stuff and bottlenecked even further that's pretty much all there is on the market the majority of the weed is going to be og chem dog or cookie especially in california and the fine varieties that don't go back to those three that are high quality varieties are, uh, you know, something I try to provide and it's very special. So let's talk about breeding a little bit. When you're, when you're, um, what type of traits are you looking for, for, for breeding stock in particular? What, what type of traits do you specifically like to chase when you're working strains or, or do you perfect them based on the, you know, kind of the, the palette that you have to work with? And then, um, uh, yeah, I have some follow-up questions after that. Well, you know, when I'm, I do several different types of breeding. I don't just do one. I, you know, do open pollinations with land race. And in that type of situation, you don't call anything. You let everything open pollinate so you don't bottleneck. You want to have as many males, as many females as possible. That's like very, very important. You know, if you have 100 seeds and you want to do an open pollination, to pop 100 seeds, don't pop 10 of them you're gonna lose a lot of genetics right there. Um, like I said, I'm really into preservation of these old clones. And when I'm working with one of these old clones, I wanna preserve the qualities of that clone. I, for the last few years, I've been working to try to get a seed form because, you know, 
you know, it's not very, you know, it's just a pain in the ass to keep them and it's not very environmentally friendly. And um, seeds are so much better than clones, especially if they're good. So when I'm doing that kind of breeding, I, you know, select for the qualities of the mother clone that's been around and I use a, a male that is preferably part of her genetic makeup, you know, something that's in her pedigree, something that's, you know, similar, if not, you know, known to be in her pedigree and um, try to keep the qualities as pure as possible. And then I got another form of breeding where I'm mashing up Northern Lights, hash plants and chem dogs and OGs. And I'm just trying to breed the most narcotic stone and shit, like shit I used to get in the early 90s from Neville when he would make his and I'll hash plant G13 crosses. And um, unfortunately, he sold the seed bank. Sensi Seeds is what it became after he sold it. It was called the seed bank. Um, when I was a kid, that's where all the good genetics came from. And unfortunately, the people in Amsterdam didn't do a very good job preserving that. So that's kind of what I'm trying to recreate with those and I'll hash plant chem dog crosses. And uh, tell people, a lot of people hear hash plant out there. Tell us uh, a little bit more about that when people refer to, the, to hash plant and what they're talking about specifically. Because uh, a lot, there's a lot of confusion, well, not so much for the experienced breeders, uh, uh, but you know, for the newer folks. So, you know, a lot of young kids talk about hash plants. They talk about like um, stuff that extracts good for modern day hash. I'm talking about plants that were called hash plants that came from Afghanistan. Um, the two cuts I work with are the Pacific Northwest hash plant cut and then the puck, also known as the scully. And um, th that one's from 1989. Um, you know, there's a lot of rumors that go around that say that's, you know, could be in the genetic makeup of chem dog. Um, I'm still undecided. It definitely probably is. I, I, I would assume there's definitely Northern Lights and, um, it's probably hash plant and skunk. If I had to guess like what the genetic makeup of chem dog would be. Um, so. That's what I talk about when I say hash plants. Um, I also have a red Lebanese hash plant, but it's an amazing plant, but it's totally unrelated to those varieties of hash plant I was just talking about. Um, the Pacific Northwest hash plant and the skelly um, are definitely clearly related. Um, like I said, with cannabis history, it, it can't be traced back. Um, I've talked to uh, the people that brought that cut to the community and it, as far as it can be traced back, it just kind of loses where it originally came from. It might be the same cut Neville worked with. It might not be. Neville uh, worked with the cut that he sourced out of the Pacific Northwest that he called hash plant. Um, that he crossed in Northern Lights number one and two, and then he back crossed that, and that was the seed banks hash plant release and that's what the puck came out of so that's my favorite family of hash plants right there since we're on the topic of hash plants do you want to talk about um as far as the structural differences between the types of plants you would grow for hash production versus for bud production because uh, there's there's quite a bit of difference uh, uh, in terms of traits that you're looking for, and uh, I know that you know quite a bit about that. So, like, like I was saying earlier, a little bit. These are traditional Afghan hash plants. Um, people have perfected modern hash plants, and. Like people that make hash nowadays aren't really too interested in these old hash plants. Um, 
new hash, you want to have really high terpenes, you know, um, like, you know, GMO extracts really good because it gives a high rate back. That's a chem D crossed by cookies. Um, Oni seeds produce a lot of crosses that, you know, my friends out here in California love to grow and turn in the hash, you know. Um, but that's a completely different hash plant than what I'm talking about. These are um, Afghani genetics that are very squat, very tight internodal spacing, very narcotic stone. Um, just a genetic that has pretty much mostly been lost, except for a few clones. Oh no, I I I I totally knew what you were talking about with the hash plant. I just meant um, in terms of structure, you know, uh, with flower structure. When you're going for smokable flower, you're looking for more of the cola, you know, the more denser colas. Whereas with hash, you're looking for more of the you know, aerated structure and, and uh, you know, more trichome production, more on the leaves and, and the rest of the plants. And uh, I guess that was more what I was referring to. Sorry if there, if I wasn't as clear. No worries. Um, but yeah, so so uh, have you found any, um, uh, you know, what are some of the, the gems that you've found over the years working with different things or some of the cool crosses that you've had the pleasure of working with or creating? Well, um, what was found in the Panama Red line is really special, and I was really glad to share that with the community. Um, you know, the CBD, I took it from a two-to-one female, um, looked through like a hundred of her offspring, and then ended up going with like 16 that were CBD dominant. Um, the highest one was a three to one CBD dominant. Um, and then I've worked it all the way now to the point where I'm can find 35, 38 to one. Um, you know, that's been cool because you know, the CBD gene pool is extremely limited basically it goes back to Lawrence Ringo's work um, and then Ben Holmes at Centennial Seeds who did the auto and you know Lawrence Ringo did the sour tsunami and a whole bunch of other awesome strains but um, the CBD crew brought the remedy um, but besides that, there's not too many others that I can even think of anywhere. Um, so it's pretty cool to add something like that. But um, what I like myself is my NL hash plant crosses the most. The Pacquiao yeah, was one I was really proud of. Um, work with the Black Domina clones i was really proud of um black dominus mix of northern alliance hash plant ortega and afghani number one and um i had an old clone from 95 that i crossed to a pacific northwest hash plant nl1 clone so pretty cool to make that in cross and get that stuff closer to seed form. Working with a purple Hindu Kush clone only that I crossed to a Kabul Kush um, and then back cross to that to try to get the purple Hindu Kush in the seed form. I'm gonna take that down to an F3 and hopefully I'll have it by then. I'm growing out the back cross right now and Definitely a lot of the seeds um, have the qualities of that purple Hindu Kush clone that 
I'm trying to work in the seed farm, and if I take it to F3 at this point after the back cross, it should be pretty good by then. Very cool. Um, what what type of traits do you look for specifically in a male? Uh, I find uh, every breeder always has a really cool answer to this question. Um, so what are some of the different traits that you're looking for in a male specifically? It's often one of the most debated questions and one of the questions that, again, they get some of the coolest answers to. Um, unless it's an open pollination, uh, I want stability as my number one quality. Um, I. You know, if it's in the fall, I'll use the indoor growth cycle and the outdoor, switch them back and forth, you know, because they're not always this, on the same schedule. Um, my indoor grows are, you know, running at night. So, and then if not, I'll switch them to another grow room that um, I can fuck the light schedule up a little bit. Generally, I like to look through a large selection of seeds um find them the males that have the the qualities that i'm trying to preserve in that cross um you know the smells the the growth structure the internal structure the the leaf structure and then i'll take a bunch of those males and i'll test them and see who passes the test and who is stays 100 percent male and um that's how i like to do it That's pretty awesome. I like the fact that you said you once you take a bunch of males and you get you pull them to the side, you grow them all together, and you see who stays male. In other words, no half hermaphroditic tra traits. And I've never heard anybody say that before. That they, you know, that that's a pretty large scale that you got going on there. I guess too. Yep, and sometimes you you do all that and you and nothing passes the, the test. And sometimes uh you do all that and um the males look stable and and then you grow everything out. I I did that recently with uh train wreck back cross and found two stable males and hit it back to the train wreck clone and um you know, the males were stable coming from that side, but the train wreck clone isn't stable and it just shot more harms back into there another 50 percent um harm rate on that one unfortunately um but you know that won't be released if you know i have the time i'll work it and take it to f3 and stabilize the the ones that are not hermaphroditic so yeah, a lot of people think back crossing stabilizes things, and um, back crossing just shows you what's behind the clone you're back crossing on. If you're back crossing on a clone that's got hermaphroditic tendencies, no matter how stable the males are, the clone is going to show itself again because it's the mother clone. Um, to get rid of tendencies like that, you need to take something that at least have three of stable males and stable females, and you know, like the seed seed buyers um, should be, you know, more aware of stuff like that. They, a lot of people are, see a back cross and they think that that means it's been worked. Um, you know, that's, it, it's, back crosses like give you what is behind the clone, not just the exact replicas of the clone. It shows you the clone's mother, the cl clone's father, and the, clone's grandparents so that's the cool thing about back crossing to get backwards to see what's behind stuff it doesn't take you forwards and breeding like you'd want to do to like preserve traits and eliminate traits wow okay right because you're saying you, you would have to be you have to be crossing two new seed generations in order to move forward that yes that's way, that right? yeah that's correct like um i did that back cross with the train wreck and i found some stable females you know I, if i were to look through that and find stable males breed those all together make f2s with that and then do that another time take a to f3 
I could easily eliminate the hermaphroditic qualities. Um, how many seeds you'd have to look through to find stable ones? It depends on the line, and every line's different because it's genetic, you know, roll the dice, basically. Now, now, how are you inducing that hermaphroditic trait expression? Uh, specifically, you mentioned a little bit about messing with the light schedule, but are you, you know, how are you doing it specifically, or do you, you not want to share that? Oh, that's it. And then just messing with the light circle, man. Um, also getting them close to the lights, because lots of times that'll make stuff hermaphrodite. And I also pound them with food. Sometimes I don't make shit hermaphrodite, but honestly, just light leaks you know because a lot of new, a lot of not novice growers got light leaks you know so 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 uh, i like the fact that you were you put them close to the lights so you let them really get heated up where they're so stressed at the top that that would really I, yeah that's a good idea i mean if you're looking to do that so yeah yeah, definitely run them closer to the light than, you know, they would. Because there's a lot of people out there that don't have, you know, so many years of experience. So try to do all the things that a novice grower would do. What about uh, structure on your males? What are you looking for in the flower structure specifically or the plant structure specifically uh, when you're looking for, you know, being selective? Um, it, like I said, it depends on the line I'm working on and I will, you know, try to preserve the, the traits of the line I'm working on, you know. Obviously with um, my NL hash plant, you know, chem dog crosses and OG crosses and stuff like that. Um, I want a really tight internodal structure. I want a solid plant, you know, that can't be damaged by wind or anything. I want um, to see, you know, tight flower clusters, you know. Um, if they don't have those qualities right there and I'm working on that line, they're going to get turned into the compost pile real quick um so you know like i said i, I try to look through a large population of them and, and isolate uh, all the ones that have the qualities that i'm looking for and then you know stress test those um it's I, I I really, compared to most breeders, I look for a lot of different things, you know. Um, I don't just look for one certain type of male, and I think that's the male because I try to preserve different qualities in cannabis. It's really my major goal. Can I ask a question real quick? Uh, so when, you're, when you're doing this and you've got so many plants, what are, pot sizes are you using? Because you're you know, to go to mature, are you using regular, are you doing regular pot sizing or extremely small or so they're quick or? Um, I, I like to finish them out in five gallons. Um, that's smaller than I would normally use. Um, so. So five gallon if you're breeding and ch and, and testing and then you go bigger if you're growing for your, your own yield and use or whatever. Okay. Just, yeah, yeah, for my personal head stash, for sure. After I found a clone that I kept, I'm going to flower it in a bigger pot. And I just think yeah, right. they respond better. That's another thing. So many breeders have different opinions about what pot sizes they use and such like that. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the uh, five because I don't have to water it all the time. And then uh, it's easy for me to move around, yeah, you know? Yep, yep. Keep it simple, right? Yeah, and keep the plant at a nice height so it's, you know, I can move it around and manage it. Um, I love your secondary reason for uh, uh, messing with the lights for, for Hermes and all, because at first you didn't clarify that, and then you said, yeah, well, I'm doing what, like, newbies would do or, or uh, uh, novice growers and stuff, and, I, and that's how I built my teaching. I, I, purposely screwing up so that I 
could you know talk about it and teach it so i, I that that's really it's all sounds like you're almost you you probably be a great teacher if you're not already teaching everybody anyway i'm not you put them in that two gallon pod in your living room just leave it there <laughs> it seems like that's how a lot of people start out and then they go oh why why is there a mouth? I, I totally get what you're going for there in terms of like trying to replicate it and um, you know what what common mistakes we all make. You know, so I think that uh, it, it's a very cool to look at it solely from uh, the perspective of stability over everything else. Because like Steve said, we get a lot of different answers to this question, but I don't think we've had people mention stability, but I don't think we've had anybody else talk about not in this way yeah not yeah, this way. and not specifically designing grow environments to expose um expose the weaknesses so that's very cool I don't think. it sounds as much like a teaching method of methodology of growing as much as a learning for yourself you know and that's how you learn i mean how can you teach someone if you didn't screw it up that way yourself i mean you just read a book and i think bob has brought that up instead of taking this word or that word or lore folklore or myth uh you know we do if we do it ourselves we we can so that's a good note for everybody out there you know don't, don't always try to be perfect if you want to learn and you know do some screwy stuff and then you'll know for sure I mean, you know, we've, had, of, we've had people talk about you know tuning their grow environments and, and testing different gear and in all the same methodologies i think but um, you know, usually it was, you know, revolving around things like yield or um, color or particular terpene profiles or other, uh, let's say, more connoisseur traits than, than just starting with a real solid foundation and, and trying to tune your environment to expose the, you know, common weaknesses that, that you'll run into. I think it's really smart really cool. No, I really like your idea of stressing the males. It's something I haven't heard people talk about is stress testing males in particular and making sure that both half of their genetics are have really been stress tested and then it's definitely uh definitely some great information. Uh, what are some of the uh, more unique or interesting mutations? I know a lot of people like to randomly post uh, their different fun stuff. Um, what are some of the interesting things that you've seen or come across over the years? Oh my God. Um, I don't even almost want to talk about it. I've seen some crazy shit, but I just kill it. Um, ex unless it was in an open pollination. Uh, it's generally those yeah. things with the weird, with the weird leaves just grow all, uh, funky and slow and but over the years i've killed some cool looking shit now that uh, i think about it so um anything that stands out in your mind anything like the the freak show or or some of the other lace leaf ones or anything else particularly funky um you know, I've seen stuff exactly like that stuff, um, and so has uh, Bamboo, and um, who I used to work with with Coastal Seeds. He had said he'd seen that stuff come up in the Fixer Holy line. Um, the Freak Show goes back to the Holy Banana he made, um, the Holy Fixer Holy Weed cross to the Banana OG cut, and. Um, yeah, I know lots of breeders that have seen stuff like that over the years. Um, and everyone yet used to just kill that shit. Um, this um, is pretty cool to see people becoming interested in, in stuff like that because, you know, I'm into other types of plants too, like cactuses and stuff. And you, you get a cactus that comes out monstrous. It's like a jewel um, through the you know, early part of this century in the 90s, 80s, and 70s, you know, free cannabis plants were pretty much, uh, didn't get shown the respect of like other ornamental plants um, because people were looking for cultivation. So, I, you know, 
and um all the ones i knew of back then that people did work on like duck duck foot was one of the oldest ones um they were really low quality um the australian bastard cannabis the reason they call it bastard cannabis is you know it's not any good um what csi did with the recently crossed into all of america's best clones is very fucking interesting you know and some cool shit yeah definitely cool is there um so what are some of the the rare or more unique terpene profiles that you've come across or maybe a couple that you've only come across a couple of times i know uh, we have a cut of G- a gas mac here that tastes like straight barbecue sauce. And uh, last year I had a Durban sunshine cut that, that tasted like um, mesquite barbecue. So uh, what are some of the more funky or rare, unique, or maybe uh, uh, just trippy terp profiles that you've, you've come across or, or maybe uh, come across lately? Um, you know, Terpenes are, uh, and, and the way people uh, describe them and different people interpret them is uh, very interesting to me. Um, that being said, I, I've fucking grown so many cannabis seeds. I've seen a lot of shit. Um, it's really just hard to um, explain uh, the terpenes um, for me, you know. Uh, it's like hard to put them in the words a lot of time. Um, I remember when we moved to Cali, me and my friends, we grew some AK-47 crossed by the four-way. That was our shit in Virginia back in the day, the Fairfax four-way clone. And, um, we grew those out and we had one that tasted identical to sweet tarts. And that was really, really fucking ahead of its time. Um didn't get you know the respect it would now now today today yeah. would be a, a total game changer yeah you like blow up game american supers like people eat that at home just like cookies right like it seems like yeah it seems like it could be a perfect flavor of the month or i don't know i guess it's sort of ended up being like the flavor of the last five years <laughs> like yeah. I, I kind of relate with the everything being cookies. Uh, yep, the fucking, you know, like cook, cookies goes back to runts and to uh, um, gelato and fucking. Um, yeah, run, runts you know, is I think it goes back to Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, all that stuff. Um, that's why I said it. That, that shit would go good nowadays if we. Had preserved that sweet tart qualities. Unfortunately, we didn't. Um, Can I ask you something um, real quick? Uh, since we're on this kind of sweet thing, uh, what would you recommend to start with if they wanted to uh, breed something that would be, you know, real citrusy, lemony kind of sweet kind of uh, flavor in the end? Because I always ask people, and nobody's ever really given me a good answer. So you've intrigued me tonight. I think you might have something for me. Well, you know, the Lemon Tree um, clone is an amazing producer. Um, Produces awesome lemon flavor, in my opinion. Um, You know, um, 707 Steed Bank Shabad um, did a back cross off of that. And if I was looking for something that was lemony right now, that's what I'd be looking for. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who say like SFE OG's lemon, you know, and um, there's also, you know, I think the Airborne G13's got lemon behind it. There's different a lot of different lemons um and cannabis and if you smoke the airborne g13 and you smoke the sfeog and and the lemon tree um the lemon tree is going to win out on the lemon tree uh it's got the most lemon for sure my opinion thanks thanks Uh, i'll look into those
Um, so what type of, how, what you, how do you grow your, most of your cannabis? Are you doing living soil or do you do hydro or do you do, um, you know, uh, something else? Uh, what is your grow methods and do you have any, you know, tips or tricks for maximizing, uh, you know, uh, the cannabinoid and terpene production? Um, I'm a hundred percent organic, um, soil food web mostly. Uh, I make fresh extract compost teas. Uh, I use a mesh bag and extract compost and earthworm castings into the water and water that on immediately. Um, I learned that from some friends and once I incorporated that technique into what I had been doing before that, which was basically top dressing with different guanos um, every few weeks and mixing up a soil base with peat and compost and earthworm castings. Um, that's basically uh, how I grow. I um, like to put less as possible in. I, I like to put things that I know that make the cannabis taste uh, amazing, burn out the terpenes, make a really smooth smoke, because I smoke it all myself. Um, I like to smoke my weed, and I like to grow it the way I like it. Um, I like to foliar feed only in veg. Um, I'm really big about making my own compost and my own um, verma compost. I've got the red wigglers, you know, that's where the turps come from. Then devouring all my vegetable waste, uh, combined with leaf matter and in, in their bin. Um, I feel like that's huge. Um, compost, I, I do two different styles of compost. I do a fungal dominated one where I put a majority of cannabis stalks and then some wild sticks and alternate brown leaves and, and grass and I, I don't turn that one at all. And then I got the one where you turn and um, I feel like high quality compost and high quality earthworm castings are the two best things you, you can grow with it to bring flavor out. So what are, um, what are some, what are some tips for good compost? It sounds like you're, you're quite versed on that. You know, you gotta have your carbon and nitrogen, uh, even or not even, but you want about 35, uh, the 25% carbon to nitrogen ratio. And when you start, looking into it, it it can become a quite overwhelming thing um but basically you just need to alternate and um your browns and your greens and you know like cardboard's gonna have way more carbon than leaf is and vegetable uh scraps aren't going to have as much nitrogen as manure or um, grass clippings. So, you know, like if you're adding in like five handfuls of vegetable, you want to add like five handfuls of brown leaves. Um, or you could just do a little teeny bit of cardboard or sawdust um to even it out and um you want to put as many you know plants in there that are full of nutrients as possible i love to put cannabis in there um nettle comfrey um i put a i just built a one i put a whole bunch of horsetail because this time of year that's full of silica um any bio dynamic nutrient accumulators you want to put those in there um that's the reason i love to put cannabis and cannabis stocks all my calls go in there and 
all my moms when they get too big they go in there and <clears throat> um you know that's how it would work in in nature cannabis plants would break down and they would feed the cannabis plants the next year so i try to Follow uh, Mother Nature as close as possible. You do anything with uh, KNF or anything like that, or uh... no, I don't do any uh, ferments. I'm not really a fan of sugars or alcohols. Um, I, 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 you know, I think this stuff's really cool. It's just, uh, I've yet to seen, um, product that's better. Uh, I've known farms that have tested Korean natural farming versus the fresh extract, um, method. Um, and I, I gotta say, I feel like fresh extract method is a million times better than brewing the tea. So, so um, a lot of people aren't familiar with fresh extract. Can you explain that to people and how that's different from tea? Well, you know, you 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 get a bio mesh bag. Um, there's a company in California, Biologic, that'll, that'll sell them. Um, and you you get the compost and you get your earthworm castings and you extract them. Um, you put for 30 gallons, I like to put like four cups of compost, the two cups of earthworm castings. And um, it, you work it with your hands until you get a majority of the stuff that will come out. Because um, if you had too much compost and too much earthworm castings uh, to the soil in the long run, the um, if you're growing in pots, um, which is different than growing in the ground, the soil is not going to be right. I like my soil to um, dry out and breathe really good. That's the reason I use peat or cocoa. And um, so, yeah, the fresh extraction, you just work the, the, the compost and the earthworm castings out of the bag, and then you water immediately. Um, so, you know, in theory, you know, uh, all your bacteria and your nematodes, protozoas and um, stuff that are living in the compost and earthworm castings, um, you know, you want them to live through the process and then be watered onto your plants. And I feel like that's key not brewing, uh, selecting for stuff that um, can go wrong in, in your teas. Um, it's just a totally different, uh, I don't know, it's a totally different system of using the same ingredients. Yeah, and, and um, it's really interesting to hear uh, a lot of people um, I haven't heard of extracts before, so uh, you know, thanks for for bringing that up. Yeah, uh, when I learned it, it was definitely a game changer for me. So, what uh, what are your current breeding projects that you got there that you're working on these days? Um, working on doing a breeding with a lazy dog male right now. Um, lazy dog's mother's chem 91. The father was Pacific Northwest hash plant NL1. Um, that's my next breeding. I just finished making F2s um, on two very cool Afghani lines that I'm gonna keep a secret for now. Um, until I release it at F3. Seems like um, when I announce something ahead of time, people seem to copy it or start working on something as similar as possible. Maybe it's just coincidence and maybe it's my crazy paranoia, but 
I've noticed it happen quite a few times. Um, just finished the train wreck back cross, and unfortunately, that didn't pass testing. So, um, finished a purple Hindu Kush back cross, and um, we're almost finished. Actually, we're about got another week left, and that's looking really good. So I'm excited about that. I really try to uh, stay busy. Um, between working these um, NL hash plant chem dog crosses and trying to get them is the way I like them to be nice and narcotic and short and squat and strong structure. Um, and then in the back crossing, trying to get clones into seed form, um, I'm finding it really difficult you know, to, to manage all this and you got to get to the land race open pollinations every four or five years because you don't want the seeds getting too old on you or you, you lose part of the population. So I got to stay busy. I meant to ask you that earlier when you were talking about the clones. Um, what is your opinion on, on you know, genetic degradation with, with clones and, and uh, you know, it, how do you go about mitigating that long term, especially with how old some of your cuts are? Um, the best thing for old cuts is getting them out in the sunshine. Um, other keys are foliar feeding. Um, you, you know, you got to make sure they got their calcium in there. Um, you know, uh, lots of times with these old clones, they got really beat up root systems. Um, they're super unhealthy. That's why filler feeding is key. You can get the nutrients in there and then you can get them in the sunlight. And those two things uh, are the top things for rejuvenating clones. Um, you want to use some um, dragonfly earth medicine. It's a great thing because they got the alfalfa in there. Um, those hormones are really key. You want to use aloe foliar feeding. You want to use coconut foliar feeding. All of these uh, things um, have things in them that will help rejuvenate the plant, um, whether it be hormones or specific nutrients they need. Um, those are some of my favorite products. Um, for getting them healthy, um, consistency. Um, you gotta be consistent with them, and it's really hard to do. You, you gotta have a, a really nice mom room. You know, everyone puts all their money and time and everything in their, their flower room to keep these old clones around. You gotta have a nice fed room, you know. So, you know, um, there's been a lot of debate in the community lately, and, you know, I'm from the old school, so, you know, I, my college was the hard knocks of growing. I, you know, graduated from high school. I was growing in high school. I was growing right out of, you know, to support myself. And so, you know, it's going to be interesting we're going to find out pretty soon once science gets involved what the hell's going on exactly. Is it degeneration of these clones? Is it just because they're getting old? Or is because a lot of old clones lose their, their smell and their vigor. Um, some people say, you know, different things. And, we're, you know, we just don't even know yet. Um, might just be different viruses in them. Um, that's, you know, the key to getting the moms healthy. Uh, either way, I don't know what the fuck it is causing the bad problems, but, you know, you get, you follow feed them. You get them growing fast. You get them in the sunlight. You get healthy, different type of growth um, under the sun than you can under any lights. And then you, you take the top cuts with that fresh new growth that just looks clean and healthy and 
you keep doing that process over and over again. I don't let any of the runoff of my mother's mix. I have a tray for each mother, and that's where it goes. Um, the runoff stays in the tray for the pot, and I don't mix them. Um, because, like I said, I don't know if it's a virus. I definitely think it's a combination of viruses and things going around. I've known um, prevent, uh, people that have lost whole collections to nasty viruses because they were using those hydro tray, those big four by eight ones, and watering all the mothers and the runoff. It was probably fusarium really nasty strain um, to spread through all the mothers. So once I heard about that, um, definitely a tray for each mom. Um, I use alcohol on my scalpels between cuts. I soak in alcohol and then I wipe, with the, wipe it with a Clorox wipe um, to kill any viruses and bacteria between strains. As I, like I said, I don't know what the fuck's going on. Um, but yeah, a lot of, uh, people that collect clones and a lot of the old breeders who I trade with, there's weird shit going on and, you know, lab testing is probably the only way to figure out what the fuck it is. And, you know, yeah, there's a, there's a great lab for those that want to get the uh most of the available or at least in my opinion reasonably affordably available uh lab tests for virals um can be got through agdia.com uh a d g i a uh, is the name of the company and they do have test strips as well as test kits for quite a wide range of mosaic viruses uh, and a couple of other viruses as well um, I know I see, I've seen a whole wide range of mosaic viruses. I've, I've got a whole bunch of different uh, pictures that I've cataloged over the years of different streaking pattern, different patterning and uh, different things that are, you know, some type of mosaic virus. And now uh, to date, we've talked about this before on the show that there's been, you know, 14 confirmed different mosaic viruses to date uh, that have been documented across multiple different countries. So, uh, and we're just the tip of the iceberg, as well as uh, leaf curl viruses, you know, just this past couple of years transferring from other other crops and other things. So it really is a kind of a crazy thing. And it's a topic that's often not really covered very well. You know, there aren't really many people that can really talk about virals. And, you know, I am in no way an expert, but I've certainly seen a lot. And, um, uh, you know, that it really is something that really is badly needed. And there really needs to be someone that kind of... Uh, you know, takes the helm on that. And maybe you know of someone that knows a lot about that that's putting information out there, but there really is not a whole lot of people out there that are experts or even putting information out uh, and that, that are experts. Uh, there, there's not much information out there. Yeah, it's really weird. I've heard of some nasty uh, for serum that people have identified, you know. Some people say some shit that it, you know, as the strain was weaponized and, um, Mozilla, the University of Montana, um, to attack uh, cannabis and cocoa leaves. Um, you know, I've heard of uh, dwarf raspberry disease being found in clones. Um, there's that stuff, dark cart found that, that came out of the hops in California. But, you know, everyone was just calling everything the clones from them were duds you know they didn't flower properly the hot you now they're selling right. yep yeah they were selling those clones for years they were just fucking up everybody's gardens and shit and people would just call them duds you know like i said uh, you know over the next you know what, however it t takes you know 10 to 20 years we'll know all this stuff but right now it's a lot of just um guessing game yeah. Yeah, and again, and until you know, it's going to be five or ten years until the, all the genetics have been mapped out and all the viroid traits have been mapped out and documented, so that people can go, "Oh, 
and they can look at it and compare it to a chart and go, oh, it's this virus, and then send out for a test kit that they can get in the mail and then check their moms. You know, it's just, we're not quite there yet. But um, between that and then, you know, some of the qPCR technologies, we've had uh, um, uh, Kevin McKernan on the show before, and some of the technology they're working with for tabletop genetics analysis and things like that is really going to help push all this stuff forward uh, on multiple different levels, uh, not only for, um, you know, increasing genetics, but also for, for things like, you know, viral detection as well. Yeah, that'll be cool for sure. So what are some of the genetics that you're kind of seeking or hunting for, or maybe something that, you know, a project that you haven't a chance to work on that uh, maybe in, a, in the next couple of years, you'll get a chance to, or maybe you're, you're trying to find that, that last other half for your uh, for your project that maybe someone out there has the other half for. I just got the HP 13 clone. I'm very happy about that. Um, mixing that one into the lines um, I've been working on. Um, I'm really mostly interested in old Afghanis. Um, I'm really gonna take all the different Lanaris lines I have and mix them into different combinations. And, uh, you know, work some packy lines in there because I like the northern packy lines too. They're very cool. They got similar structure, but they got a little more sativa influence, which adds some cool terpenes. So. Really excited about working, you know, Afghani lines and Paki lines, lane race lines that have, haven't been crossed to each other before to make that happen. I'm, you know, not saying uh, Afghani and Paki crosses haven't been done, but just with the different lines I have access to. What about land races? Is there any land races that you've uh, are still evading you? Um. So I like my land race to be old stock. I want something like, um, you know, like, say your father has in his sock drawer that's Acapulco gold. That's what I want. I don't want to go to Acapulco right now and try to find Acapulco gold because it's all been watered down with shit from fucking Amsterdam. Um, I am interested in new land race, but um, most of it isn't as cool as the older land race I've been able to acquire. Can you explain a little bit about what you mean by watered down from Amsterdam and in respect to, because I don't think everybody in Amsterdam sucks, but you know, I just want to hear what you got to say on that. No, by, by all means, some of the best breeders in history have been in Amsterdam and have worked in Amsterdam. And, you know, there's definitely some amazing breeders that still work there. Um, I'm a big fan of, you know, Karma Genetics, and he's a Dutch breeder, but um, I, I specifically talk about uh, the the way the Sensi Seed Banks went downhill, and that's the number one seed bank in Amsterdam. Um, they still sell all the strains that they did when I was a kid, the exact same names, exact same strains. They're not the same. They don't taste the same. They don't smoke the same. They don't do nothing the same. So to me, it's, you know, that's a sad state of affairs, man. And, um, you know, that's what I mean by that. And, okay, you so know, it's more of Sensi Seeds, what happened at Sensi Seeds and not just the condemnation of all Amsterdam genetic or seed banks. Yeah, but er, er, most every seed bank in Amsterdam used seeds from Neville, either Northern Light Skunk or Northern Light Taze Crosses. Um, there was a few, you know, other people doing unique shit, you know, but a majority of the, the lines are just that. And then, um, yeah, they just don't have the genetic diversity like they once had and like is held in California. Right, right. Yeah, I agree. 
I mean, they, there's more of a stable, like you say, the old school strains, crosses, genetics, and all that. They, you know, they, they attempt to to keep the same no, thing, like you said. I, I think you he's, I think he's more referring to the, the fact that like there's a couple of there's a, well, without naming names, there was a couple of people that kind of went around the world collecting things and then also traded a lot of Amsterdam genetics that were then put into faraway places that maybe didn't have direct access to the outside seeds or maybe because of the you know increase in price of pounds, um, you know they were able to slowly acquire uh, better seeds from from overseas in order to up their production for you know just increasing profits of international trade but you know both things kind of being uh, contributing factors cool so um, so is there uh, any other uh, anything else you'd like to share with us before we let you go I don't want to take up your entire evening I just want to say, uh, we, you know, we need to stop bickering amongst each other as a community and um, we need to stick together and, and, you know, if you got some genetics, if you're not going to preserve them, get, to, get them to someone that will. There's a million breeders out there that are getting interested in open pollinations. And, you know, if you're not going to take the time to do it yourself and you got some old gems from an aunt or an uncle or a father that you to smoke, you know, give them someone that will use them and don't cross them to cookies. <laughs> I really hate growing cookies. It's so annoying to trim and little buds and, and never anyways. Um, <laughs> uh, when I say don't, don't cross them to cookies, I mean, not just cookies, but everything that is related to it. And, um, sunset sherbet, all that you know it's it, it took over the market you know there's it's like i said it's very hard to find a strand these days it doesn't go back to chem dog cookies or og kush is there a specific reason why there's kind of so bottled neck back to those handful of strains in particular there's you know far better than most uh your average clones um and then the cookies took over so hard because of the marketing. Those guys had genius marketing. The weed's good, but the marketing behind it is fucking genius. Um, not that I respect them, but, you know, I don't hate them either. So I got to give them, you know, they changed the whole world with the those genetics. So. Yeah, but you say, like you said, everybody was looking for that, what you could clone the crap out of and produce the most pounds. Out of. And that, that was a lot of it, like you said in the beginning. That's, huh. now, is, there, is there any um, maybe uh, longer flowering uh, traits that you don't really see much anymore these days? That was the other question I was super stoked to ask you on. You know, there's a lot of really cool things I do feel, and it's a shame that they don't get the um, the price point that they deserve, you know, because they take so much longer, and they flower, uh, you know, it's, it's nearly as dense, so it's, you know, like long, fluffy spears that take, you know, anywhere from 80 to 120 days. Um, it's really sad, you know, to watch them just fucking disappear. I try to observe a few of them, but um, I only have so much space and so much time, and I really am specializing in Afghanis. But, yeah, <laughs> more people need to dedicate um some time to help preserve sativas in the community that would be really fucking cool if people want to get a hold of your genetics um how can they uh how can they do that we work with a bunch of seed banks um 
you could follow uh, the Crickets and Sadas Instagram or Mr. Bob Hemphill on Instagram um, for those drops. So I don't keep mails around. Um, I do a project. Once it's gone, it's gone. Um, and I, there's a few that I will re recreate, but that doesn't happen very often because um, I'm always trying to do things that, you know, between between my three major goals of breeding, it's uh, just not enough time for me to do as much as I would like to for sure. And uh, what are the, uh, do, you have, what, do you have any strains that are available right now? What are the, the stuff that people uh, could go out and buy if they're, they're super stoked right now? Um, I'm very grateful for the support. Um, I think a lot of the stuff is sold out pretty quick. I think, uh, um, Speakeasy Seed Bank is going to have some stuff. Um, JBC might have a couple things left. Uh, the Seed Source might have a few things left, but, um, everything I just dropped recently sold out pretty fast. I'm going to be dropping the Purple Hindu Kush. Back cross and then the purple Hindu Kush, purple Kush males spread into Baba Kush and purple Oracle with all those seed banks um, if they're interested in carrying them. And then um, I've worked with the regenerative seed bank in the past, but they're out of my stock now too. So um, you, you just got to watch for uh, drops as they come along is the best advice I could say about that. Awesome. Well, uh, I was super, super stoked to, to, to try and get my hands on some of that here in the future and um, definitely looking, looking forward to that and really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show and share with us your, your knowledge on breeding and uh, man, especially that, that, that tips on on males man that was such a such a cool thing about the stress testing males that i'm super stoked to to try and uh and try that in, in the future so uh, thanks a lot so uh so much for coming on the show i apologize uh, for the late start um for those of you that aren't uh watching this on video um even well there is no video for this episode but uh we've had all kinds of problems trying to get this show going technically uh uh for whatever reason the api for google is down to connect to zoom right now it may or may not have something to do with the riots going on so uh we'll see what's going on uh here in another couple of days uh it could be very interesting the government is suddenly trying to regulate social media so we'll see if that's a good or bad thing for our industry so anyways uh you can um why don't you tell everyone how to find you one last time uh, uh bob uh, they want to find you on social media or, or elsewhere mr bob hempill on instagram or crickets and cicada seeds um and i want to say thanks again for having me and it was a pleasure talking with you guys you were great man. it was great to talk with you and get to pick your brain a little bit for sure yeah, really appreciate you having a great you. time. We've uh, we've been wanting to have you on for a long time. We're we're glad to finally be able to have you on. That was awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And uh, Roger, why don't you tell uh, everybody how to how to find you if they want to reach out to you? Yeah, you gotta check out Roger Latewood uh, on. I might be Roger underscore Latewood uh, on Facebook and. Um, you can find me at um, I love growing marijuana.com. Awesome. And you guys Great can, point. and you guys uh, can find me at potent ponics and uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, uh, and all the different audio places. And uh, be sure to check out a uh, uh, true aquaponics.com. If you need aquaponic nutrients, or if you're look, you know, I have an aquaponic commercial system and you need a subscription service for your nutrients. We can get you set up with nutrient testing and, and customized nutrients for your commercial system, be it uh, anything from lettuce to cannabis and everything in between. So uh, be sure to check that out if it's a service you think you might need. Thanks a lot. And uh, we'll catch you guys again next time. Cheers. Good night.